Welcome back, everyone, to the 3F Podcast. As always, your host, TJ Clayton Cornell, with his co-host, Jeff, the miniature mule, Maheen. What the fuck was that? Where'd you come up with that one? Uh, I always got to come up with a new one every week, and you posted a photo like two days ago saying that you're a beast, so miniature mule is where we're going. Uh, And another special guest today, we have Morgan, the personal trainer. Yes, pleasure. (laughs) <laughs> well, thank you for coming on. Before we get started, thing we ask every week and every guest, what are you guys drinking today? Jeff, we'll start with you. Oh, you start with the min- miniature mule. Okay. Um, the miniature mule is drinking, um, can't see it, agua, just straight up water, a little bit of salt in there. Keep okay. it hydrated. Morgan? I'm drinking water as well. I got a little bit of lemonade mio in it to give it a little flavor. See, I'm a sweet tea Mio drinker, but I've got some homemade carrot apple juice on top of my water tonight. So I'm getting fancy. Interesting. I like it. Taking that free juicer and earning our monies from it. (laughs) Um, And side note, when it comes to making your own juice, it is way more expensive than buying store-bought juice. Just so everyone knows, to make like a whole thing of carrot apple juice, it's like $11 of produce. (laughs) So... (laughs) It's absurd. I mean, you have your own, like, I know what's in it, but at the other time, it's like three times the cost. It's all that. It tastes better, though. I will say it tastes better. But so, well, let's get started into the interview. So, Morgan, stage is yours today. Let's start with the first off, and this is a fitness episode. How did you get started in the gym? Like, what was your first journey? I'm going to take it all the way back to, gosh, high school for me. So growing up, even before that, I was an athlete growing up. So I played soccer, basketball, and softball from when I was basically walking um, up until I graduated from high school. So I didn't start going into the gym really until probably my senior year of high school and really into my freshman year of college. Um, Actually, my boyfriend at the time in high school was kind of the one who showed me the ropes as far as going into a gym. Um, We both belong to Retro Fitness, so a very, you know, basic gym, had, you know, your equipment and stuff like that. However, did we really know what we were doing? I guess, sure, I was kind of just following him. I mean, he played football and stuff like that, so he kind of had an idea, but I was basically just following his role Um, and that grew into something very special because I developed a passion into, you know, working out and helping others fall in love with fitness, you know, just as much as I love it. So it kind of started from there is being in athletics up until high school and then kind of taking it from being competitive in athletics to fitness. Okay. And when did you get started on the coaching journey? I started coaching, I guess you could say online. Um, last year was when I officially started accepting clients online. Um, however, in person and, you know, training clients in person that started in 2017, I got my certification, um, through NASM and literally the day after I got my cert, I was hired at LA fitness. (laughs) So I started, training clients in 2017 while I was still at school at Towson at LA Fitness and um that's how I started training from there yeah I ended up that was perfect my next education uh question was education I got my NASM cert in 2015 and that's when I started coaching but NASM just released a how to be a fitness influencer course on their website and I feel like my certification is now worth a little less not gonna lie (laughs) really the that people are paying i'm sorry if somebody's listening and like wants that but i'm not going to pay nasm 300 dollars on how to be a fitness influencer on like as an official that's a continued education credit for anyone who has nasm if you want to continue your credits every two or three years you have to do a ced continued education and that's an acceptable continued education right now i don't know how i feel about that I'm, I'm going to be uh, honest with you. I don't know how I feel about that. Uh, I think it's a joke. Jeff, what, how would you feel if someone came to you and said, I'm a NASM certified fitness influencer? Um, I would. 
do you want me to like be nice or right <laughs> i mean I, I feel like the, the giggles and the way you responded is all we need to know on <laughs> you're a nasm certified fitness influencer hmm. see i knew they offered marketing material like helping you with your marketing and all that and your branding but i didn't know that they went that far it's it's a new one it's just started like they they've had marketing for a long time but yeah that's that's a brand new cert <laughs> sorry i digress do you have so obviously not that it's required do you have any other uh like education or uh, any other certifications other than my nasm and then i guess my bachelor's degree um i have a bachelor's in exercise science from towson so i, I feel like that's, that's like a too. really prestigious degree yeah, to have like, too. Yeah. Like that's, that's yeah. the next level if i was going to hire a pt you know like person with a bachelor's or a person with just a cert like me I'm going to lean towards a person with the bachelor's 10 times out of 10. Yeah. Like that's, that's, you know, three to four years of education versus two months with the textbook and paying $75 to go to some test center and hope you get a 70. True. Hope. <laughs> so how was but, it? So, oh, what's up, Jeff? How was it working at LA Fitness? I used to sell memberships for them, but I always wanted to be on the training side, but the training side always looks so cool. So what was that? What was that like for you? I would say it was a cool starting point, especially if you're get like first getting into training and stuff, and you kind of have no idea what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, I will say they where I was, they kind of just threw you into the wolves. So that's how I really had to learn how to like approach people and kind of market myself business wise too. Um, but it was also a cool experience because a lot of people who worked there went to Towson. So it was a younger um, crowd of people who weren't there. So it was just cool. I met a lot of different people who are still one of my like best, bestest friends today from LA Fitness working there. So um, I'd say it brought me like really close relationships and it taught me like the business side of things. I'd say if you really want to develop yourself as a trainer I wouldn't stay there um just because the pay is as you probably know is like being a membership hey, hey. counselor it was pretty low on the totem pole it was so trash it was so trash it was yeah um but it was a cool like you know being a full-time student and having a little side hustle it was cool I'm not gonna lie yeah. but you know took it for what it was worth yeah, I mean, they uh, Gold's Gym had a very similar thing, unless you ended up getting that lead trainer role. And there was times of years where they threw you a bunch of leads and other times they didn't throw you any. And it was just like, you have to walk the floor and hope you talk to somebody that needs training kind of thing, like have a good conversation. There was not much vertical <laughs> inside Gold's Gym. And don't get me wrong, was, San Antonio Gold's Gym was amazing, but there was it was, if you were down with making like 12 to $16 an hour, at least back then, it was a great starting point. There right. was nothing past that. There was very rarely did you go on your own. You had to run everything through the front desk kind of thing. Yeah, it was it was an interesting time. So you started, you've been training for four, almost, sorry, five years now, 2017. Oh. We're not in 2021 yeah. anymore. And then you started doing online coaching and inadvertently or in, like, on purpose, growing that social side and your your internet reach or social media side so what are some things you did to like build a brand on social media so first and foremost i i don't know if you know this but i have two instagram accounts so i have the one that you follow who i've you know we've been talking through um i call it my business one which is morgan the personal trainer but i also have a personal account um that was like my first account and I would just post, you know, my personal life, whatever. And then it wasn't until last year when I wanted to get into the social media side of training, I made a separate account and I started posting on that. So from there, to be honest, when I first started, I didn't really know what I was doing. I was just kind of posting pictures when I was working out. Um, I... I'm an affiliate through Cutler Nutrition. So I started posting pictures with products, trying to get out there with that. Um, and then it just kind of formulated into um, 
reaching out to people to take, you know, pictures for photo shoots to get more professional pictures. Cause I feel like the aesthetic from a professional um, photograph is much more appealing than just your average photo. So I selfie mode. Uh, <laughs> so I, you know, wanted to schedule more photo shoots to have more professional pictures for, you know, social media, also my website. Um, and just kind of staying up as far as the trends and stuff. I mean, we all know reels now are taking off like crazy, um, especially, you know, the reach and stuff like that with non-followers. So I think it's just a matter of me learning to basically make it a job to post every day um, and get something out there in the feed every day. And then, you know, stories, stuff like that, um, tagging people, tagging, the trending hashtag, stuff like that. Um, I will say it's a, it's a job within itself for sure. Um, I mean, I'm still you're, you're trying, a marketing agent. Yeah, I'm, I'm still trying to learn the ins and outs of it. Um, but I'm also very new to it too. Like I before was not that type of person where I can just sit in front of my phone like and talk to my phone and record myself because I just that wasn't me like I I feel like I'm so awkward in front of the camera and I still am I'm getting better obviously but um I don't know like I just had a hard time at first trying to really put myself out there as far as brand wise because being on camera is just weird I don't know I just felt weird I mean I can definitely feel that I, I was at physical therapy today for my shoulder and this dude was live streaming on his Facebook and talking to everyone, like 30 people in this PT clinic. This guy's just talking to everyone on his live stream. And I'm sitting there like, I don't know if I could, uh, I know a lot of guys like uh, guys who were on Cutler Nutrition that would be on like the Stairmaster and they'd be taking questions as they're doing Stairmaster. I don't even know if I could do that. This guy was in a crowded room talking to all his friends and family on Facebook while getting worked on and doing his stretches at PT. So okay. I guess some people just have it naturally and others don't. <laughs> yeah. Like well, it. It's a skill. I feel like on my feed, it's always the same people that are on live all, all the time. So <laughs> it kind of makes sense. I mean, he's probably a guy that goes anywhere and is just on live. <laughs> That's true. I did want to bring up a story before we move on. I remember you were doing a Cutler giveaway. And I can't remember if I, I was almost winning or I just messaged you and was like, man, I wish I got this. And you're like, you don't follow this account. I was like, how do you pop up on my feed all the time and I'm not <laughs> following you? Like I lost this giveaway, possibly lost the giveaway just because I'd never pressed the follow button. But I had like, I did the likes, I did the comments, but I never pressed follow. <sighs> so I ended up losing out on some brand new supplements. Wait, why does that feel like it was so long ago, but it was really only like a year ago? I guess it's kind of a long time, but That's still. Totally. Yeah, seriously. Wow. But how has that changed? You know, that's a great part about, you know, you've had to build this brand. Luckily, if you're building the social media side, you have more people that are on social media because we have more people that are not working right now. But like, how did you through three years of training to two years of nothing or almost nothing with COVID in building that social side in your online coaching. How did that work? So when COVID started, I had brick bodies when COVID started. Um, and it was a very weird time. I'm not going to lie. Like switching to virtual training was just a hot mess. Um, it wasn't my cup of tea. I'm a very hands-on person. So the virtual side of things was just not of my interest. And in August of, I think 2020 was when it was like the first summer of COVID. Um, I actually took a step back from training and I got another job, full-time position, um, working for a fingerprinting and private investigative agency. Um, wow. Yeah. Complete 180, yeah. I know. <laughs> but um, so I, you know, took a step back, one, because financially I needed 
to make money and training during COVID was, you know, merely impossible. Um, but two, I kind of like lost that passion a little bit for training just from being virtual and not having that one-on-one personalized experience with people. Um, so I worked like a nine to five job Monday through Friday with this fingerprinting, um, just to see, you know, take it day by day. I mean, no one really knew what was about with COVID. So I started that in September of 2020. And after a couple months of doing that, I was like, this is not me as, as cool as this job is like this, this is not where my heart is. Um, my heart is, you know, training and I have a huge passion for training and I want to get back into it. And I was pondering the idea, um, a little bit, kind of talking with my mom about it. She was like, no, like you need somewhere secure. Like this is giving you a paycheck. The parent thing. Stay with it. Right. Um, and I was like, mm, I don't know. So, and that's when I made the, the separate Instagram. And that's when I slowly started to kind of build myself up from there. And I, um, reached out to a couple people about like studios and stuff like that in the area to possibly like get my foot in the door somewhere. Um, cause I knew I didn't want to go back to like a commercial gym. I wanted it to be, um, on my own. And someone actually wind up reaching out to me about a space. Um, and it just so happened it worked out. It was really close to me. Um, he worked out something with me, which was awesome. And I eventually started cutting my hours back at that full-time job to train. And here I am basically a a year later and I've built my book from scratch and I'm full-time doing this now. So you can do it. If if you really want to do something, you can do it. And I really wanted to get back into training again and I sure did it. And we love hearing the, uh, the people who chase their dreams you know, actually built something that from the ground up being a, you know, we're all all entrepreneurs here. So building your own brand, like you said, from nothing into something, I feel like it's, well, it's way more pride than you were getting any other job and it's passion. It's really, what really makes a difference. So like, I'm really glad you stayed true to yourself there. And we're like, no, this, this, this isn't it. Cause you could have just lost your way and stayed at that job. Right. Cause I'm pretty sure it was a solid job. So if you were, if you were anybody else and didn't have that kind of like entrepreneurial spirit in you and weren't passionate about what you did, you would have, you would have just lost it. You would have never, you wouldn't be here today. Like, I don't know. It just feels like, uh, you stayed true to yourself. And that seems like something that's like a lot of people aren't willing to do. It was like, it was a hard decision. I'll say that because my mom who you know has been by my side this this entire time um she was wanting me to stay at the job because of the security of it and you know as far as like my mom my mom's sister and stuff like she's always had a desk job and stuff like that so like a nine to five is all secure and all but when you go off and actually do something on your own like a business you know especially with training Cause we all know training is up and down, but it's a matter of following what you like to do. You know, I didn't want to be, I would always, you know, think about, I don't want to be, you know, sitting here two, three years down the road and be unhappy. Like I want to be doing something um, and take risk and, and actually challenge myself that and show myself that I can do this. Um, even, even like starting from scratch. You know, even if my mom was like giving me a little handful about, "Mm, you probably shouldn't do that. Well, you know what? (laughs) I want to do it. It's something I want to do. I'm going to say what I got in trouble from my my physical therapist. You're just going to send it sometimes. You just got to send it and go for it. I got in trouble for doing that, but you just got to back yourself and go sometimes. Sometimes it's, you know, it's for the best. Going back real quick to the social media side of things. How do you, how do you deal with, with all the pressure on the social media and like, like how, how, what, what, what has been like all of your, so obviously posting content and adapting to all the social media stuff has been 
a challenge in itself and mm -hmm. it's always evolving and you're always going to keep adapting but uh on just I just want to hear more about those challenges that you've had that have presented themselves ha that have presented themselves to you and how you've been able to address them sure um I think the biggest thing is things on social media as far as what's trending and stuff like I try to separate myself into something more unique mm -hmm. um because you know the way I see it is like when I go into the gym for say like I don't want to record my whole workout like I just don't want to do that and I feel like t in today's world like everyone has tripods, like everyone's recording their whole workout or showcasing their outfits and just, yeah, the, the image that some things are being put forth on, on social media and stuff like that is trending right now in a way that it's challenging because when you're actually trying to put real content out there, like, real genuine content um it's almost being overlooked because so many people are focusing more on the bs mm -hmm. versus the actual content that has substance to it that has a genuine person behind it that's looking to better everyone and not just oh i'm gonna put this out there to get the followers to get the likes and yet I know nothing about what I'm putting out there, but I'm just doing it because this is the image, yeah. um, if that makes sense. So it's a huge hurdle because, you know, when you're posting it, you're essentially, you know, you're in, I don't want to say you're in a competition, but, you know, it's as far as the algorithms, it is, yeah, as far as the algorithms and stuff like that, people are more likely to click on, you know, something clickbait wise, you know, versus actual content. It's more so just about trying to separate it and put out genuine, organic, you know what I'm trying to say? Yeah. Not the best. I think we have a perfect example. We had a, a DPT, a doctorate of physical therapy, natural bodybuilder and coach who runs a coaching business on on episode i think it was 10 and 11 or 11 and 12 james johnson and he puts out daily or mo mostly daily but multiple times a week he puts out true scientific information scientific back things and he has you know he maybe has like a thousand two thousand followers mm -hmm. he also has a podcast called natty news daily they go over all the natural bodybuilding news in the world uh going on in the u.s uh a niche that a lot of people don't pay attention to. They always take this focus on the IFBB when we know that a lot of those guys are not natural. So these young guys who are trying to, and young girls who are trying to copy these physiques physically cannot because they're not natural. They can get very lean and very muscular and really tap into parts of their body that no one else has. But unless they go unnatural, they can't look like these guys. But they'll follow these, you know, these monstrous bodybuilders and these you know, hard workers but they never look at like the natural side to see what's truly obtainable. So like these people that are out there putting out these scientific and truthful content and these re more realistic for the natural people, they're getting nothing. But the guy who's doing uh, muscle ups with a chain and a bench tied around his waist has like oh six God. million followers right now. Don't get me wrong. It's fun to watch. But if we're talking yeah. about workouts, why is the guy who's providing like useful information not on there? Cause I, I can't even imagine how many people have tried to do something like that and got hurt in their gym or destroyed the gym there, the equipment that they're at. Exactly. But looking at it from an outside perspective, if you were to go on um, that person who's doing the pull up with the bench around their waist, if you were to go on his account and look at their followers and then go on to the coach's account who has the doctorate and see he only has 2000 in today's world it's like someone's gonna put more of their attention to the person who has more popularity yep. versus the person who's actually giving useful info 
And do you feel like when you're coaching, you, you, you coach men and you talk, you could, we're going to talk later about the women's side of everything. Cause that's something that's not touched on in the fitness industry. I feel like, like, do you feel like that affects when you're trying to coach people and this is all they see on Instagram. It's all they see on TikTok. You don't understand the amount of conversations that I have with clients where it goes. So I saw this on TikTok. So I saw this on Instagram and immediately when they say that i'm like shaking my head like no 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 no. continue i know you're gonna I, that's that's all I was, that's what i was getting at is like how many times does that happen to you like i will don't you know small disclaimer there's been some good stuff like you know mark smelly bell you know the bell power project podcast learned a lot of stuff from his instagram learned a lot of stuff from knees over toes so there is useful information out there but there i sure. feel like it is the one to two percent versus the ninety-eight percent of just absolute dog shit that's getting posted yes. on TikTok. Yes, and oh. that didn't start happening until about a year ago, because you know there was still everyone would Google stuff before, so now people are seeing it on TikTok or Instagram or whatever, and it's just another source of where bullshit is being marketed being advertised in great awesome sound bite bits too like it, whoever was in charge of the tiktok's marketing needs a raise whoever over oh and i think it was originated like it, the founders are in china or wherever it is they're geniuses like in a terrible way because we're all addicted to it they're geniuses ridiculous i so, actually like I had TikTok over COVID, but I deleted it and I didn't start using it again until probably a couple of weeks ago to start posting my reels. Other See, than that. I respect it from a business perspective, but I feel like I'm one of those Game of Thrones guys who like, I never had TikTok. People who like, I hold out, like I never watched Game of Thrones. You're missing out, but I feel like I'm on the same level as them right now. Jeff, did you ever have a TikTok? Oh, fuck no, baby. What the fuck? You'll <laughs> never see me on TikTok. I will never make a TikTok real. I'm not going to watch TikTok. That stuff. Okay. You know, you're going to make a real when you come down to visit next. Uh, No, sir. I'm yep, going to report it. it. We're I'm doing not going to be in it. I, I refuse to partake in TikTok for many, many reasons. One of them being it is brainwashing mind-numbing just awfulness there are a lot of people that provide value on there but they're drowned out by the gimmicky weird teenage girls doing dances and just awfulness that's on the internet it all hey. gets drowned out it's like the worst of human nature comes out and that's what we're attracted to i'm good <laughs> liver king has a few million followers on tiktok you love that guy yeah, but he's also gimmicky and, and extreme, and he's also roided out and jacked. So of course he's gonna get all the followers. Oh man! <laughs> like you would, you wouldn't want to like watch a guy eat raw beef liver or like, why have vegetables? Right. Have testicles? Like, right. come on. <laughs> this is the last one. I feel like we need to get back on topic. Did you see he cut a fish reproduction hole by himself and ate the eggs out, and his wife just ate the eggs out straight of the fish hole? Uh, like, yeah, whole, you know, like, like tuna. Cut the slit that they lay the eggs from. Squeeze the eggs out. I'm sorry, what? Dude, that's that's like Liver King right there, man. You didn't see the one where he like filleted a cow and 15 minutes later took a chunk out of the liver. He just took a picked up the whole liver, a bite out of it. I, like, I feel like I can uh, raw extreme. raw meat is a big thing. I it, that is historically normal. It's why we have appendixes, which is why they burst. We don't use them anymore. It's why we have molars to rip raw meat. I understand raw meat. When you literally put your mouth on a, a, a part of my language here, but I got to say a, a fish vagina and suck the eggs out, I'm, I'm drawing the line. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> it's a, that's a new, uh, it's a new that's all I'm saying. <laughs> Let's get back to the episode at hand here before we had a, a rant on TikTok. <laughs> Disgusting. If you had to say a few things as a coach that you feel like the basic people need to know, just some like two or three quick tips, nothing crazy that you feel like people need to know when they go to the gym. Um, hmm. 
don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, especially if you see someone that looks like they know what they're doing. Um, cause more than likely they'd be willing to help you out. Um, but also, you know, coming from a coach's perspective too, um, don't be afraid to actually like invest into a coach. Um, honestly, like I'm a coach and I have a coach for myself and I'm not going to lie to you guys, but working with another coach and other coaches in the past, I've learned the most from them about just fitness, um, nutrition, behavior change, psychology, all along the lines of like coaching other people from them versus your generic, you know, personal training certification, or even like my degree. I've learned, I've learned more just from like working with other people and getting, you know, like getting help from people who are educated and know what they're talking about. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, surrounding myself with people that are driven and have an idea about fitness and about nutrition and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, don't be afraid to ask and, you know, expand your horizons, but at the same time, don't do anything stupid. <laughs> no doing power cleans while having like two chairs on the end of it. I don't know. Like Please don't. no, no squatting with the row machine as your foot peg what or doing fuck? Bulgarian split squats with your, the row machine slider yeah. as your foot peg. Like Bulg you, Bulgarians are hard enough. Like, why are you adding a, like a sliding seat to it? <laughs> Oh my gosh. That's yeah, the dude Bulgarian. who's posting the, oh, like, he's like squatting the squat rack while like on a BOSU ball. He posted a video of him doing split squats with the row machine butt slider. I feel like I already, I'm already wanting to cry when I have like 40s or mm -hmm. something when I'm doing splits. Oh, that was like my favorite TikTok of you or reel that you posted. You said you had guys who were complaining when you gave up like 15s when you told them to do bulgs. And you would tell like the women, here's the 30s or 40s, and they would do it like twice as hard as the men were. Exactly. Exactly. Can I add one more thing too? Go ahead. I think the the biggest piece though that I wanna, you know, hit on is staying true to yourself. You know, don't change yourself because other people are doing it. And that goes with things on Instagram and getting surgeries and just other stuff like that. Like stay true to what yourself and what you're worth and what you're striving to do, but don't change yourself because other people are doing it too. So I can't get a BBL. <laughs> I mean, do what you want, but at the same time, you know, don't do it just because other people are doing it. If you really want it, that's, you know. I've got to be, is that, is BBL Brazilian butt lift? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I don't need one of those. You guys are dealing with a dad here. Like, you've got to give me, like, a little bit. I'm not, like, I know, LOL. You're younger than me. How don't you know this? Everyone at work is saying, like, cat bussing for real. I'm like, bro, what is going on? Can we just go work, please? <laughs> Oh God. So, you know, on the topic of, you know, working out and everything, what do you, what is your favorite split that you would go for? Mm, good one. Split as far as like, like you know, body. people do upper lower, people do full body every day. I'm a big fan of PPL. Yes, me too. I was just going to say, oh, I'm a, good. I'm a huge advocate for push pull legs. That's, yeah, feel, that's been my cup of tea. The I feel like the bro split is finally being phased out. Guys who only do chest on Monday and always skip Wednesday because it's leg day or maybe they only deadlift on leg day. So I know, you know I feel like it, this is a loaded question because a lot of people, you know, it depends on what you're doing. Athletes, mm -hmm. you can do PPL, but you're going to be doing full body every day, pretty much if you're in an athlete situation. And I understand some people only need to go to the gym three times a week. 
PPL is great. You're going to the gym four times a week, upper lower split may be great, but I feel like a lot of people neglect PPL and either go for the bro split or CrossFit, which please don't get me started on a rant about CrossFit ever again, Jeff, but yeah, yeah, yeah. stuff like that. It's, I was, I love hearing trainers that are fans of PPL because I, I hate when it's like, I've got a client, I'll, I'll see you four days a week so we can hit chest and shoulders, but like we're kind of wasting their client's time by making them hit the, the bro split so they can get more sessions with them. Uh, no, see, I, I, I love the push pull legs and honestly, I'm not a huge fan of, I've never been a huge fan of the full body. If someone comes to me and tells me they could dedicate three days a week to work out, I wouldn't, my first thought wouldn't be full body. It would be push pull legs. That's just my, my recommendation and my viewpoint on it. And everyone who seems to do it gets results from it. It's not just from that, you know, standpoint, but full body is just, I feel like it's too taxing, especially for, you know, people who are new to working out and stuff. I think it's better to divide up into push pull legs and learning movement patterns versus just throwing everything into one um, and trying to fit it into. That's just my point on it. Yeah. I feel like that's a big issue with people who get started in like these, you know, these CrossFit gyms or stuff like that. Like you're throwing them into one, some of the hardest motions of Olympic lifting and to the, you know, like you said, you tell a person they need to do their, their squats, their Romanians, their push-ups, their pull-ups, and like, you know, some arm motion or like an overhead press, their body after coming from sedentary lifestyle into that active lifestyle is just going to get information overload first off. And then so fatigued so quick because their, their cells are not built to regenerate from that. Right. My one thing I try to staple into my clients specifically, um, especially when it comes to training is like less is more. But you, you, the way you say that, you have to look at it from a training point as, okay, you know, depending on your goals, it could kind of vary to this. But, you know, pick five, six or whatever exercises, do them, do them with working sets. When I say working sets, I mean effort. And, you know, once you're done, you're done. You're not staying at the gym for two, three hours just – doing more at at that point it's kind of just like you're doing your what's the word where you do you do more and it's kind of counterproductive there we go the law of diminishing returns also comes in returns well morgan i'm gonna need your help just just stare at death for jeff for about three seconds for this one calling me saying he's going to the gym for two or three hours at a time no this is what happens when you're at home in Florida. Are we socializing though, or are we working out? Jeff doesn't socialize. <laughs> oh no, no, no. There is, there is no. I, I show up to the gym with those horse blinders and a hood on, <laughs> and like headphones covering my ears over the hoodie. Like you don't talk to me while I'm working out. The problem is, is I have no concept of time in the gym, and I am just an animal, so I don't realize that I'm there for three hours. You're the mini mule. Having fun. Gosh. I'm the what? The mule? What's the mule thing again? The mini mule. Mini mule? But why do I have to be a mule? Mules are hardworking animals, dude. Mini mule. They carry a lot of stuff on their back. They help plow the fields. They're staples. Staples to farmland. Fine. I'll accept it. All right. (laughs) Jeff, that's the next question. Mini bowl, but... um, Okay, so kind of address like how to optimally train let's go into some of the diet stuff okay what kind of diets do you like to follow or prescribe to your clients or recommend suggest whatever you want to call it and for god's sakes please don't say you've ever told someone to do keto uh no i'll have a fit um so the way i do diets and nutrition plans and stuff like that is um I do have a couple of clients that I do macros for. um, And that's just because of their schedule and their preference and what they like to follow. Um, I think my biggest thing behind it is we're going to do what 
works for you and what you can follow. Obviously, you're not going to follow something if there's something in it you don't like. Um, so one thing I do with my coaching and my onboarding is I give you a questionnaire to fill out. Um, it's pretty detailed. It's pretty lengthy, but it gives me an idea of your day, your schedule, what you like, what you don't like, um, and just going through certain things. Um, so I know what to put in and what not to put in. Um, I'm a huge advocate for eating smaller meals throughout the day. So typically five, six meals throughout the day. Um, again, that also depends on the person's schedule. I work with some nurses where it's kind of hard, um, to fit that amount of meals in, but we can kind of switch things up from there. But um, my main thing is the small meals um, and then including foods that you like. Um, but, you know, when I say that, I mean healthier options. Um, if someone says they like ice cream and donuts, we're going to forget about that because we're not adding that into the this plan I'm making for you right now. Um, but what I do like to do is, you know, have a client have a, I call it a free meal, um, along the lines of throughout the weeks and stuff, how they're doing and stuff and how they're adjusting to and stuff like that. Um, to give them almost kind of like a reward with a free meal. Um, I don't call it a cheat meal because I feel like cheat meals just put a bad rap to, you know, certain things, but calling it a free meal is just better in terms as far as mentally and stuff like that so I like that I like that phrasing yeah um and normally when I say that too I'm I'm a big like advocate on good digestion so normally when I say free meal I normally follow it with please don't eat anything that'll fuck up your digestion <laughs> um so yeah I'm all about you know small meals adding what you like what works with your schedule because like I said um if you like it you're more likely to follow it and then just kind of play around with little things like that um in the beginning it's kind of trial and error but after figuring out someone and their biofeedback and stuff like that it's pretty it's a pretty cool process to see people actually enjoying um making foods certain ways giving them certain recipes um air fryer, slow cooker, you name it. I mean, there's a ton of different ways to season your food and make it taste good. So also if it tastes good, you're going to want to eat it. So, you know, like, keep it simple. I feel like now is the best time to stick to a diet in the entirety of history. Like you have, like you said, you have air fryers, you have slow cookers, you have instant pots. Uh, you have literally everything under the sun to, to make your diet. And you have, if you're a fan of like sugar-free sauces and stuff, you have all these sugar-free sauces that can help you stick to your diet. You know, we drink Zevia's Jeff and I do still waiting on that sponsorship check Zevia. I don't know when you're going to send it, but, uh, you know, stuff that kind of gives you that, like that lead into like, this is what my brain thinks it wants, but it's on that better side. Um, I really like what you said about that free meal. I want to bring that in. Um, you know, this is one thing that, I fall off on every now and again, but have you ever, in, you know, personally, this is my thing, but like prescribe some intermittent fasting or messed with that on your own side, ever looked into that? I've tried it myself um, before COVID and stuff like that when I was kind of playing around with things, but um, I'd say with any clients, no. Um and for me, when I was doing it, it was the, the simple 16, 18, yeah. uh, eight hour or 16, eight hour window. And yeah, it yeah, wasn't if anyone anything. Has any questions, you can go back to episode six, listen to our episode on fad diets and our diets. And if you want to listen to my 20 minute rant on keto, it's in part two. <laughs> I need to listen to this, this rant about keto because uh, I, I, I had I had like scientific studies that backed me oh, up wow. to help and like I, I went in like I prepared for that rant and I was trying to avoid it but I was like I don't know 
I feel like it's like an argument you have with like your girlfriend or your boyfriend. Like if they say something, I have the screenshots to back me up. That's where I was at with that. Right? <laughs> I wasn't going to bring it up. And Jeff was at, like, he, he brought it on. He brought it up two times in the episode. I was like, all right, TJ, here, here's your time. Here's your podium. And I was like, all right, let me pull up my document that I made and let's go off. <laughs> oh, <And> so <laughs> like, I keep digressing. This is a fun episode. So when we go to coaching, you talked about, you know, your free meals, you talked about the, that bioavailability, that biofeedback and everything else. When we were dealing with the sexes and this, we're going to use that term because there is, whether they're biological or identify, you still have biological differences, but you don't have a biological male versus a biological female. Have you noticed a big difference with fitness and the diet, like both, both sides of the coin from coaching? Um, especially when it comes to females, you'd be surprised, but a lot of females don't realize that they're not eating enough. Mm -hmm. Um, and majority of women that have come to me, um, who have plateaued, you know, as far as their goals and stuff like that, when I get them to start eating more, that's when things start to shine. It's like a whole new world. But at first, they're cursing me out and they're like, what the fuck? This is so much food. I can't do this. Mm -hmm. And it's like, hold on. You haven't even given it four days. Mm. Come on. What do you think is going to happen in four days? <laughs> Jeff, what can happen in four days? Uh, I don't know. What can happen in four days? You just did it for like four days. You went off your diet for four days and ate nothing but oh. like a lot of food. Oh, dude. Oh, oh man, this is crazy stuff. I don't, I mean, I'm not prescribing this to anyone or telling you to do it, but <laughs> I was like hardcore on my shit, on my diet. And I was in a deficit. I've, I've been in a deficit for a while. I'm trying to get all shreddy. You know what I'm saying? Um, but uh, I had like a McDonald's binge for four days straight. Um, so I was eating all my meals and then I was like still starving at the end of the night. So I just for four days straight, it was just, getting some nuggies, getting a couple of McDoubles here and there. The other day I woke up, I was like lean, vascular, like I was just like, oh my God, I've transformed. Hit the, I hit the gym today. I was like strong. I was like, man, I really needed that. That was like a nice refeed. Those now, extra calories really made a difference. I told him why this is. This is the perfect example of what bodybuilders do in their peak weeks called the refeeds or yes. even the, the weeks leading up to it. And this is especially for women, like you said, my wife, she realized she was eating way too little, way too much fat, not enough protein. You realize you're stronger, but if you're in a hard deficit for a long time yes. and you refeed your body a surplus of calories, it's going to put it like, oh, we have extra, put it in the muscles because we're so depleted. You're going to look fuller. You're going to be stronger in those times. And you need to keep those windows short. Like four days was probably too long, but like two days or like two big meals depending on what you're dealing with. Like if you're in a bodybuilding prep, you're probably getting like one meal a week or every other week that's prescribed. But that small refeed, which is essentially what these women were getting, were they not? Exactly. It's like you're doing chemistry with your body. Yes. Literally. Um, but it's, it's so common. I mean, nine times out of 10, the women who come to me, like as far as nutrition wise, they're not eating enough. And it's a very hard uh, mental curve to like get over eating more, especially with women. Um, I think it's just a thing nowadays where everyone is on this like 1500 calorie diet where, come on. I, I, like you said, at this point, when you're doing that for so long, your body just doesn't know how to respond to anything. So the moment you start feeding it, it, it comes into this machine and voila, your metabolism starts working again and things start, everything just gets into balance again and, and things start happening. Good things start happening. I don't, I don't know how people can do like 1200 calorie diets. I've sent Jeff screenshots because whenever we do fasting, we'll send each other ideas. I will eat like 1600 calories in a sitting and be hungry an hour later. I was going to say that's one of your meals, like a 16 yeah. hour. Like, I'll, I'll eat like, like no joke. I, 
this is a work meal and uh, hope, hopefully my buddy Raphael is listening. I had a 16 ounce ribeye, like a post cook weight with 16 ounces with two bananas, uh, grapefruit, and I'm pretty sure it was about a six to eight ounce sweet potato. It was a medium sized sweet potato. And I was still kind of hungry after all that. This is this this was when I was intermittent fasting. That was one of my last meals of the afternoon. It was my post workout meal, but that that was about like just the ribeye alone was 900 calories. That, wow. that was like a 16, 1700 calorie meal in one sitting. But that's because you know I do rugby training and everything else. So like that's what my metabolism requires. But like, when people tell me they're on 12 to 300 calorie diets a day, I'm literally thinking that is one of my three to four meals in my my out in my fast window. They literally hate themselves. <laughs> That's torture. I, people don't understand, like the body needs more than just that. I mean, granted your body in a day burns out alone just doing nothing. So yeah. add on all the other activity and anything else you're doing, you're already like, that's a major deficit right there. Yeah. And the, you're sedentary, you're really, are, uh, resting metabolic rate, RMB or RMR is well over 1200 calories. If you get up and walk to the bathroom three times at work that you're probably burning that. Right. Um, so I have one more before I turn it over to Jeff. You know, we talked about some of the, like the, the sugars and stuff. We've talked about diets. You quit caffeine for a little bit. Are you still off of caffeine? Oh, <laughs> that was like a, a very short lived thing. Um, I took a break for ca from caffeine about probably, a, it was a little over a week. Uh, and then shortly I was like, I need a coffee. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I love coffee. I can't go a day without drinking coffee. I'm not going to lie to you. Um, I will say though, I used to take pre-workout too. Um, but I've stopped doing that. So now my day just consists of actually one cup of coffee. Whereas before it was like two, two and a half. Um, so I've definitely cut back on that and I've noticed a big difference in like being able to sleep and just function better and not being so jittery and stuff like that. Um, I also feel like I just got like really sensitive to it too, leading up to, you know, cutting back on it that I just needed to pull back from pre-workouts and stuff like that too. Um, but yeah, I still need my one cup a day. That's, that's a must. There's a, I will say there's a great history episode. I think, I think it was on Joe Rogan. He had like a specialty guy on caffeine on and he talked about like, well, one, like how the humans created the great enlightenment from caffeine, because that was the exact time when coffee was introduced, but two, like it has become embedded in our brain to even have like one cup a day is just like required. As long as you're having it like 10 hours before bed, like if you're doing a morning cup or a mid morning cup, you're great. Mm -hmm. I was bad. We talked to an episode last week about how me and Jeff have been driving lifts. So I've been doing that on top of working like 12 hours a day, working on planes. And that's just to help buy another house for my real estate business. But so when I'm doing that, I'm on like, six to 800 milligrams of caffeine a day. Like it'll be a cup of coffee pre-workout and then like a Celsius in the afternoon just oh. to get through the driving hours. Like, so 600 is a good day. Like sometimes there's no coffee or I don't have the time to make the coffee because I slept in because I was out till one in the morning when I woke up at 5 a.m. So I'll be like bang pre-workout half a bang. <laughs> so I'm at like 800 some days. I was only at 90 today. I had, I had a, a Jocko go thank you for one of our sponsors but i had a, a one jocko go today so i feel really good i'm gonna probably sleep the best i have in weeks tonight because i had caffeine at 9 a.m it's nothing since yeah we drink enough pre-workout to kill a horse oh um we honestly if the mini drink, mule jokes are just like right there the whole time <laughs> the what it's the, the mini mule jokes are right there so far a horse is not a mule you're stronger. That's my point. <laughs> but I'm smaller. Anyway, no, but we do like what today I had a cup of coffee in the morning because I slept like shit last night. Then I had a scoop and a half of total war, which is 
just insane. It's mind numbing. You want to scratch your face off. And then I, I had a bang as well. And on a normal day, it'll be a scoop of total war. And uh, shortly after a monster, so I can make it through the night while I'm driving those extra little hours. Um, and I am cracked out of my mind. And normally I'm a crackhead energy just without it. Just feel like a zombie on the inside sometimes, but it's going to be hard to quit. I've been thinking about quitting all this caffeine stuff and it's hard. Every time I go into the gym, I'm like, no pre-workout today. <laughs> I do one set of like anything. I'm like pre-workout today and a Gatorade. I'm trying to quit sugar and pre-workout at the same time. It just doesn't work. Oh God, um, your body's going to go into shock. Dude, I'm going to shut down. Um, okay. So speaking on that, right. So how do you, how do you, First off, congratulations for like making it a week without caffeine. And secondly, uh, just to move, just to kind of move forward here, how, how do you, how do you stay consistent? Like, how do you fight the moments when you're like, you don't feel like showing up, you're hitting a plateau, you feel like crap, like, like, what do you do to kind of stick, stick to it, stay motivated? I see my thing is like, the way I have everything structured for myself and having a coach um, above me, I feel like that right there just keeps me to, or it helps me stay accountable because uh, it gives me structure and I'm all about structure. And when I have structure, I can stay disciplined. And since I've been doing it for, I've been with this exact coach for over a year now. Um, so everything's kind of just out of habit now. Um, whereas, you know, before I would kind of just like go about the day. I didn't really have a plan when I went to the gym. It was kind of just like how whatever felt good I would do um, mm -hmm. versus having an actual plan, and an actual training plan mm -hmm. and diet um, and just following it. It's kind of just like out of habit. I wake up in the morning. I know exactly what I'm eating. I know exactly what I'm training, what day it is. And it's just routine. And I love routine. I love structure and I love routine. And that's the best way I, su I succeed. Awesome. So, you know, you talk about your routine. So we'll talk about you, you eat five to four to six meals a day. That's a part of the routine. What is your favorite meal? My favorite is, um, so I don't know if you guys are a fan of cream or rice. But um, there's something called the Flavor Gang, which is a company. Um, it's my coach's company. And they have a hot cereal. It's not um, cream or ice because that's trademark, but it is a hot cereal. Um, they have a bunch of different flavors, brownie batter. There's like a strawberry one, peach. Um, my favorite is the brownie batter. I have that literally every day before I work out. Um, and I'll normally do that with like, an egg white omelet and I'll put almond butter over it and that'll be my pre-workout meal and typically it's my favorite and the one I look forward to the most. Shout out to your coach's company because I have his uh the, it's like I can't remember which sauce it's one of the mustard based sauces but I have it from a buddy of mine who, but yes. Yes. So that is in the fridge at work for the days that I'm like rushing in the morning and I cook my beef and rice and I put nothing on it. That is in my fridge at work, put it on everything, coming in clutch to save me at work. The best. I literally have turned a lot of people on to the hot cereal just because one, it's brownie batter, it's chocolate. I'm a big, I'm a huge chocolate fan. Like I'm human. I love sweets. Um, but it gives me that like satisfaction that I need um, and just enough where, it, you know, I'm still eating a carb source, but it's still chocolate based and great fuel for my workout too. So, you know, it's kind of the best of both worlds. You can still have a little bit, you know, have your cake and eat it too kind of situation. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so one more thing before we get into our closing questions and our funny closer. We, you know, you're, we talked earlier about you're very passionate about like training with women. It's a, like I said, it's one of the main reasons we wanted to bring you on today. So what would be a, a, a big portion about what, how, like how you train women, what you try to do with them and what's your favorite thing? 
Uh, one of the things that I have such a huge passion for is pushing women to be able to essentially become a badass. Like, I feel like the image that women have in the gym, it's like, you know, the typical cardio, whatever. It's like, no, women are strong and we're a lot stronger than you think. And it's just all about building that confidence up in order to be able to actually, you know, lift in the gym. And I love being able to teach women how to correctly move and how to correctly lift in order for them to be able to go off to the gym on their own and essentially make men look like pussies, to be honest with you, because why not be a badass? Like, why not be strong? Like, you don't have to be bulky. It doesn't work like that. But at least go into the gym and feel confident enough to be able to lift weights and not just be a typical cardio girl at the gym. The cardio bunnies. The cardio bunnies. I will say one of my like favorite videos on that was the like, chick went to do bench press and it was at like a good, good gym. Like, uh, and if, if for all the Charleston listeners, the, it's kind of like, um, crap of course the name's leaving my mind but it's one of those like awesome garage style gyms and the guy was he was medium size like when we take these off she's like no i can take it she just like unracks like 225 and starts repping it out in front of him like yeah like screw that dude how dare he ask that let her get it let if she wants it off she can get it you don't just right. take it off for her <laughs> so what would be your favorite your personal favorite motion because i know it's different from you not your clients wouldn't be your favorites but my favorite, what would you say? My favorite what? Your favorite motion to like my favorite. just go show off. Mm, probably deadlifts. I love deadlifts. Can we, can we, do you know your like your current one RM? Honestly, I have not done a one rep max in a while, but this past weekend I pulled 275 for eight. Hell yeah. Repping 275. So yeah, my training is based on a lot of volume. So like nothing under 10. And it's most of the time to like 15. It's still, I mean, you tell me to do two, you know, two and a half plates for five plus. I don't like doing anything five plus on deadlift. So I'm already tipping my hat to you. Like, even trap bar, if I saw it before my shoulder injury, you're like, you know, five reps of jump deadlifts. I'm like, no, why why do I have to do five? <laughs> Can I just do five jumps and then five deadlifts? I don't want to do five jump deadlifts right now it's trap bar but still uh god yeah, yeah. Yeah. women are strong that's the whole point let women be strong yeah exactly yeah. so how do you how do you approach when women are like hey i don't want to be like i don't want to look like a dude or i don't want to get bulky like what do you tell them because that's i hear that often i got my sister into working out just recently she's making insane progress by the way so kudos to emmy but uh uh how do you like, how do you, cause whenever a girl's or a woman, whatever has told me, Hey, I don't want to get bulky. I get really pissed off. Cause I understand that they're not going to get like manly and bulky. Right. But like, how, how do you, how are you able to explain that to someone or show them like, Hey, you're not going to look like some dude. You're not going to have big bulging shoulders and like, whatever, like weightlifting doesn't do that to you. Like, how do you explain that to them? How do you comfort them? Um, so the first things first I touch on is, you know, women don't produce naturally the same hormones that men produce in order to be able to build that certain muscle like that. Um, but, you know, also just going to show that, you know, other women, other clients of mine to show them like, you know, this, this is her and this is what I had transformed her to, you know. I feel like and, also. And this, in, and this one was in a year's time. Like this was in a year or six months. Like things don't happen that fast and you don't just bulk up like that unless you're taking something, you're taking PEDs of some sort. And also, you know, a food has a lot of things to do with it too, but it's more so, you know, <laughs> the hormones we naturally create in our bodies just aren't able to do that. And I feel like that's such a big stigma 
um, today because I still get people to this day that still say that, but it's having that one-on-one conversation with them and actually, you know, saying it clearly to them that we don't produce those hormones naturally. So, you know, focus on training, focus on, you know, other things because that is not even in the picture right now. Right. And I feel like, you know, that's kind of a loaded question in a way. Cause you can just be like, yeah, do I look like a dude? Like, you've right. been training <laughs> exactly. like five, six years be like, yeah, is this <laughs> more, right. I feel like most women would probably, when they go to your gym, if there's like a row of trainers, they'd probably go to you because it's more relatable. Guys are going to go to the guy that they want to look like girls are right. probably going to go to the female first. That's just like, so like how we work like psychology wise right so well jeff do you want to ask our like funny closer or do you want to go into three f questions first uh let's just ask the funny closer just okay well before jeff asked this we've asked all the other trainers we have had on so this is something that we've hit mixed reviews on jeff take it away okay funny closer are you ready for this i'm ready okay it's going to sound absurd. <laughs> um, wow. Okay. Uh, I can, it, it's easier to, okay, never mind. Uh, is sex cardio? Just is sex cardio? Um, your scientific evidence. I think it depends. I think the, the depends. worst possible answer. Okay. Here's my, okay. When I refer to cardio, I refer to anything that makes the heart work harder. So getting your heart rate up. So if it's getting your heart rate up to a certain point for an extended period of time, then yes. Ah, see, that's that's the catch right there. Extended period of time. Damn it. If it's for 30 seconds? (laughs) Seconds. No. (laughs) No, I'm sorry to break it to you, but no. But for an extended period? It's a sprint. It's a sprint. You know what I'm saying? I don't know. One lap? This is the same. We had IFBB pro David Gwynn on. He had the same exact response. He says, unless you're doing some acrobatics, that's 20 minutes long. It's not count as your daily cardio. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, for so over two on this one. So for the, oh, for the professionals, yeah. the professional uh, sex havers of the world, they do cardio. The normies, there you go. So the normies, you're barely getting your heart rate up. Let's get to the three F questions, the final closers. So, so what we ask every guest, how does your family life keep you successful? I, so when it comes to family, you know, I feel like this is kind of a deep question for me, particularly because like, um, my like my parents and stuff like are divorced and you know my my family's kind of split and I feel like having my mom specifically in my corner and my dad too but um it motivates me to challenge myself even more um you know just seeing things that my mom went through and stuff like that and um the impact she's had as far as, you know, sending me to school and being able to become independent on my own without my father kind of in the picture and stuff like that too. Um, so really just maturing, um, at such an early age and becoming really independent has really developed my character. And I look back on it as a blessing, you know, even though my family isn't all together, um, I look at it as kind of like a, a very positive viewpoint on it as it made me into a very independent person. Okay. And, you know, you talk about some of these, these harsher, uh, the negatives that you had to go through, split family and everything, which, you know, same thing here. Uh, my, my parents were just split. My father is still in the picture for me. So I don't understand that side, but how do you keep it positive? Because you've had this negative thing. Yeah. I mean, my, my father's still in the picture too. Um, but I, I'm like a little closer with my mom. Um, but 
I think it's more so just a matter of um, knowing that my mom is such a hard worker and I definitely always look up to her as far as how hard she works. And even in my sister too, like we're always constantly like staying busy, working, trying to pick up side hustles here and there. Um, just because we like, we like working, like we like challenging ourselves and staying busy. And I feel like that's always something I'm going to keep with me and always push my, push myself to do more. Gotcha. And so that's a great like internal driving force that you've had. And that's what's keeping yeah. you. Okay. So coming from the family side to the fitness side, the other, one of the other F's, the whole point of the episode has been as on fitness. So how do you, how do you get your diet to work and how do you get your fitness to work with such a busy schedule? Cause you have so many clients, you have this online coaching. Um, staying prepared. Um, you know, I try and prep what needs to be eaten the night before, um, having all my meals prepped, um, even I, you know, cooking stuff in bulk, basically buying stuff, stuff in bulk, um, meal prepping, using obviously the slow cooker, you can throw like tons of chicken in there and it'll be good for a couple of days. Uh, but just staying prepared, honestly. And like I said, having that routine, um has definitely helped along the way too all right and the last one on the finance side what would be the biggest piece of financial advice you could give to somebody who's a trainer or just in general it, it can be friends family listening if you want to make it from a trainer perspective do it from a trainer perspective um i would say number one save um, number two, as far as today's world, marketing is so, is such BS out there. Don't waste your money on things that you don't need. Um, you know, save your money and put it towards something that you know is well worth it. Um, but also work hard too, you know? pick up side hustles, you know, like you said, you do lift and, um, that's like a little side hustle. Like I dog sit still, yep. even though I, train, I do Rover, I dog sit, I'm dog sitting right now. Um, like just little things to, you know, little side hustle cash is King. Why not? You know? So Especially in a time like this, <laughs> Yeah, now would be the only time that you want some uh, some cash on hand with everything going up rather than some stuff invested. I know um, Jeff probably cringed a little on the cash is king frames. I know Grant Cardone isn't big on that. You're a big follower of Grant Cardone. Yes, um, but no, but okay, cash is cash is not king when it's sitting in a savings account collecting basically zero interest. Right. Um, but when we are entering a recession and a lot of things are going to be on discount you, you you need a little bit of fluidity there you need some cash because you're going to be able to uh capitalize on all the opportunities if you have a little bit of cash i just i think cash is trash if you're saving every single penny in a, in a savings account i think a little bit of savings is good uh cat a little bit of little percentage of cash on the side is good all the time but mm -hmm. not like Hey, let me just put all my cash into savings like my grandparents did. You got to invest it and multiply it. And cash is amazing when chicken and beef are both up $2 a pound. This is unacceptable. Oh, dude. And I love beef. And eggs. Yeah. And well, eggs. I, I eat half a dozen eggs a day and the price Seriously. of eggs has gone. Like I, I get the brown eggs. I, I, I'll get brown free range eggs. They went from like two ninety nine for a dozen to four ninety nine a dozen. They almost doubled, doubled in price. Yeah. And even like the cheap eggs, where they used to be like a dollar ninety nine for thirty six for the skinny white ones, yep. and I would eat like eight or nine of those. Even those are like four or five dollars now. Yeah, it was like yep. eggs were supposed to be my cheap food when I needed to save money, and I would just like eat six of it. But they're almost the same price as chicken now. <laughs> oh, God. It's terrible. 
I was eating the pasture raised eggs and they were so affordable. And now it's $10 a carton. And I'm just like you, I'm eating six to eight eggs a day. And so that's basically like, I'm, I'm paying more than beef to eat some eggs, if but I they're good for you. They're supposed to be a little bit better for you. Not significantly, but they also taste way better. If, if I actually post this video, people that are watching can see me rubbing my temples in my eyes because eating 42 to 4,500 calories a day is killing my bank account guys you have no idea yeah yeah this is this is so bad but well so that's all we have for you tonight do you have anything you want to say to any of the listeners uh where to find you we'll put that in the show notes but what what's your ad on instagram what's your website so we can put it out there for the listeners um my instagram is at morgan the personal trainer so original <laughs> And my website is morganthept.com. Sweet. So everyone, if you're listening, give her a follow at the least if you want to check out some online coaching or you're in the Baltimore area, right? Yes. You're in the Baltimore area. Go Ravens. Need some yeah. one-on-one training. Need some one-on-one training. Reach out to our good friend Morgan. Thanks, everybody. You have a good night.